Amen. All right. Right before I uh, get started with the sermon this evening, there are two things I forgot to mention. Um, there are some free items in the foyer out here in the, in the eating room. We've got a, a school desk, uh, if you, especially if you do homeschooling. I don't care what you want to use it for. If you want to have that desk, you can have it. The, the, the top lifts up, and it's a, a chair and a little desk all in one. Anyone that wants to have that is free to have that. There's also a bunch of books and, and containers back there. Take as many as you want, uh, all kids' books. So um, those are free for the taking. So um, I forgot to mention that during the announcements. All right, Psalm 116. This evening I want to preach a sermon entitled The Pains of Hell. And it is important to preach on the subject of hell uh, from time to time because it is a subject, one, first of all, that you won't hear very often, unfortunately, in too many churches these days, because it is an unpleasant topic, because it's not something that anyone really likes to hear about very much. It makes you uncomfortable. I mean, it's something that, I mean, even now, just thinking about hell, if you just stop and think what hell must be like at this very moment, I mean, you don't want to spend too much time thinking about that. It's uncomfortable. You don't like to think about people's souls right now being tortured in hell. Hell is in the center of the earth. There's no sunlight getting in there. Now there are flames, but there's no light. It's dark. So the souls that are burning in hell right now, it's dark. And they're just experiencing the flames, the hellfire and the brimstone in hell right now. And, and look, we need, we need to remember this. Because the whole point of Jesus coming and dying on the cross and offering up salvation is because we all deserve that penalty in hell. Hell is a real place. Too many people we talk to, we go out soul winning. Too many people, you talk to them about hell and they'll say, yeah, you know, I don't think I necessarily believe it's like a real place. I kind of think that, that there's hell here on earth or that we're living in hell right now. Kind of what we experience now is hell. Look, you, if that's what you think, you have no idea about hell. If you think this is hell, this is heaven to those in hell. That's how, how completely, how, how, how much worse hell is than your worst existence here on this life. And we need to get that in our mindset and, and just understand the realities and the truths about hell and not forget it. And you know what? When you go soul winning, don't skip over hell either. It is a critical part of the gospel. If hell doesn't exist, what do you need to be saved from? So there's, there's a few points that I want to make today uh, just specifically from the scriptures regarding hell. We started reading Psalm 116, which is an awesome... Uh, psalm regarding salvation especially and it brings up hell here look at down to verse number three the bible says the sorrows of death compassed me and the pains of hell get hold upon me i found trouble and sorrow and and notice it's tying together the pains of hell because hell isn't just a place of like well you're just sort of separated from god you're just over there not with the group not in the light now that no it's the pains of hell. And we'll go into more detail with that later in Luke chapter 16 when we see the story of the rich man and Lazarus and, and seeing explicitly just being spelled out that hell is a place of torture and torment. The pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. But look at verse 4. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Amen. And that's how simple salvation is, by the way. Look, the pains of hell got hold upon me. I was in death's grip. But praise the Lord, all I had to do was call out unto God, God, deliver me. God, save my soul. And it's so easy. It's so easy to be saved. And so few people receive that gift. But if pe more people understand the reality, look, hell is real. And if you could feel death getting hold of you and the pains of hell getting, getting a hold upon you, you would call out on the Lord too. 
But it's something, unfortunately, that people can't see. They don't realize it. They don't make it real in their life. They think, oh, I'm, I'm really not that bad of a person. And, and again, that's another real common thing I've been running into. It seems like more and more and more on a regular basis. you got to take the time and expose to people, look, you're not as good as you think you are. We all want to tell ourselves that we're great. And you're not. It's the bottom line. In God's holy eyes, your righteousness is like filthy rags. We don't, the girl we're talking to today was saying, well, it's not fair. It's not fair that someone who knowingly is going to commit a sin and commit a really bad sin, like, like someone who gets an abortion, just they know it's wrong. They know they're killing someone. They just go ahead and do it anyways. Yeah, that's wicked. Just, well, it's not fair. I said, it's not fair that you should be saved either. It's not fair that any of us would go to heaven. It's not fair. Because we all deserve this punishment of the pains of hell. Because of our sin. So it's not fair for any of us. But you know what? Thank God that he loved us enough to provide a way out. To provide salvation. To literally where all we have to do is look up and call on the Lord and say, God, God, deliver me. God, save me. I don't want to die and go to hell, Lord. I'm trusting you. Please save my soul. With the faith in your heart and calling on the Lord, that is salvation. Now look, isn't that simple? Isn't that what we see in the context here in the scripture? Why do so many people want to attack calling on the name of the Lord for being saved? So it's a work or you're adding to salvation. Look, this is the, the most normal thing, the most, like, I would say even a natural response. Look, when you realize you're in trouble and you realize, like, you're drowning, you realize you're going to die, what is the most normal thing to do is call and be like, hey, help, help me! Someone save me! And when you know the condition that you're in and you know that the pains of hell are gripping hold of you, doesn't it just make sense that you're going to say, Lord, save me! Of course it does. Of course it does. I believe, therefore have I spoken. And this church is never going to change on our methodology of preaching the gospel to people and leading them in a prayer where they're going to call on the Lord. Because what we're doing is trying to get them to see that they need a Savior so that they want to call on the Lord. We're not trying to manipulate people to call on the Lord. That's not going to work because it has to come from their heart. But when you realize, look, I, I, I need a savior. I don't want to go to that place and that place is bad. I'm just going to call on God to save me. That, amen. amen. Let's keep reading here in, in Psalm 116. Verse 5, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul. For the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? And look at verse 13. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And there we see it again. Just tied together, calling on the name of the Lord for salvation. I believe, therefore, have I spoken. It's right there. It just makes sense. And look, this sermon isn't about calling on the name of the Lord specifically, but it ties it. I mean, this is, this is so just ingrained in Psalm 116. You, you can't separate. I can't even talk about one, Psalm 116 without bringing that up and making mention of that fact. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I really want to point out here is that verse 3, and I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Because there's another point I'm going to make, which I've preached an entire sermon about in the past, but I want to just draw attention to 
Psalm 116, verse 3, that reads, The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow with what we're going to read in Acts chapter 2. Because we understand that the punishment for our sins is an eternity in hell. That hell is the death wages that we owe. Right? The way, for the wages of sin is death. And as not just talking about a physical death. So how could you say that, Pastor? How do you know? Well, one, one, little babies, infants that die in the womb, they didn't, they haven't committed any sins. Yet they still physically died. Infants could physically die. It's not a result of their sin. But when we sin, we don't just fall over dead either. But the first time that you have that age of understanding and you are accountable for your actions and then you choose to commit a sin, that's when your, your spirit dies. And that is the wages of sin is death. Just as Adam and Eve, in the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die, they didn't physically drop dead and just fall on the ground and physically die, did they? But the question then is, but did they die? You better believe they died. When they lost their innocence, which is why we believe in an age of accountability, the, the, the unborn child, the born child, the young child that doesn't know they're in their innocence, they don't sin. They can't sin. But as soon as they got that knowledge of good and evil, then they, they, they ate of the fruit that God commanded them not to eat thereof. That's when they died, and they died spiritually, which is why we need to be born again. And it's a spiritual birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. You get that spiritual birth is the second birth. And... Um, where was I going with that? I don't know. It does not have to do with Acts chapter 2 as much, though. Let's look down in Acts chapter 2, verse number 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having, look at this, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So here we see the pains of death being referenced with his resurrection. Now, the, the penalty for our sins, and that's where I was going with it, the penalty for our sins is the death penalty of hell. The place of death, okay? That is the penalty for our sins. So when we're looking to a Savior and we're looking for someone to pay the debt that we owe of our sins, if the wages, if what we've earned is death, well, Jesus Christ had to satisfy that death for us. In order for the, the, for the punishment to be paid in full, it had to be, I mean, why would it be any different than the punishment that we would face? That doesn't even make any sense. And what we see here in Scripture is that that's exactly what Jesus did. And not only, as we'll see in a minute, as he quotes Psalm 16 in Acts chapter 2, just in verse 24 alone, what are the pains of death from the resurrection? So if he died three days earlier, right, and then the resurrection came three days later, what are the pains of death at the time of the resurrection? You following me? Right? So like the pains of death, if it's only a physical death, because what I'm doing is I'm refuting some other doctrine that people teach, a false doctrine that people teach that Jesus Christ's soul did not suffer in hell. 
right? Some people even say, I mean, his soul didn't go to hell, but that's ridiculous. His soul did go to hell, but not only did his soul go to hell, his soul suffered in hell. How can you have the pains of death then being loosed? The, why would it be the pains of death? Where does the pain come in of Jesus being dead if, it, if all the pain only happened on the cross? And look, this is not minimizing in any way the death on the cross or the bloodshed, not in the slightest. Because that is extremely significant for our salvation. I mean, I can't overstate the importance of the cross. So don't think I'm just brushing the cross aside. But what we're doing is we're looking at Scripture and saying, well, how can I understand this if Jesus' only pain that he, that he experienced was only on the cross? How does it being loosed from the pains of death make sense and being not possible that he should be holden of it? Jesus was being held by death and the pains of death. Well, what did it mean in Psalm 116, verse 3? That seemed very easy what that was talking about, didn't it? When it said, the sorrows of death compassed me, surrounded me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me, so it got hold upon me. That makes a lot of sense. But now all of a sudden, oh, well, no, when, when it was Jesus, though, I mean, losing, losing the pains of death, that, that's just talking about the physical. Psalm 116 was talking about the spiritual. Because the psalmist wasn't even dead. He was talking about, he was, he was worried about going to hell. Man, is that my car again? I hope not. No. Never mind. Not a big deal, sir. I'm not trying to cause a distraction for you. I was just... That happened earlier today. Yeah, that's not me. <laughs> Thanks. That's someone else's problem. Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible he should be holding of what? Holding of it. Holding of what? The pains of death. Jesus Christ was dead. He was dead. Not just dead physically, which of course he was, but, but he suffered death for us. And this is a, a, a passing note, but I, I might, I'll just kind of bring it up anyways. I wasn't really planning on getting into this, but, you know, some people will say, ask the question, well, did God die? Right? Did God die? And people have called me, oh, that's blasphemous. How could you dare say that God died? Because I believe that God died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And Jesus Christ died. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why people have a problem with this is because their idea or concept of death would be a definition of one that would be like, you cease to exist. But that is not the definition of death that we see in Scripture anywhere. Nobody ceases to exist. When life is brought into the world, when, when a soul is created and exists, that soul is eternal. So when we're talking about death versus life, it is where is that soul going to exist for eternity? You have eternal life, you are not in hell. And if you have eternal death, you are in hell. Death gets relocated to the lake of fire. We'll see that in a minute, but this is the definition of death. So when we say that God died or Jesus died, he didn't cease to exist, but he absolutely descended into hell. And that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He had to do so. He had to do so. He had to descend into hell and have the pains of death get hold upon him. But he could not be holden because he had to rise again. It couldn't just keep him. So Jesus Christ conquered death and hell and has the keys to death and hell because he wrought the victory over death and hell. Yep. But he still went to death 
and hell because that is what every sinner deserves as a punishment for their sins. Look at, let's keep reading here, verse number 25. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So this is the reference to the soul as well as the body. In verse 27, you're not going to leave my soul in hell, and you're also not going to suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So the body didn't corrupt, degrade, rot, right, as, as human bodies will after death. Jesus Christ's body, his physical body, did not just decay and rot. So, you know, when he was resurrected, it's not like he looked like some zombie or something that's like half eaten of worms or whatever, okay? And, and you know, we, I, it's not something to even joke about either, right? Some people that, wanna, that might want to, you know, blaspheme the name of Christ or make fun of Christianity or something will make references like that. But look, our Lord and Savior, his body didn't see corruption, and he rose victorious from the grave. And it was a physical resurrection. He did come back from the death. Praise the Lord. But let's keep reading here. So this is the quotation from Psalm 16. Let's keep reading verse 28. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And now becomes the exposition of this passage by Peter. Verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. So David was the psalmist that he's quoting. And he's explaining, look, David, the prophet David, King David, he's dead and buried, right? Been so for a long time. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. We know where his tomb is. We know where his grave is. And his body's still in his grave. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on, the, on his throne. So because he's a prophet and he already knows God made a promise unto him. And he knew that, that God made the promise that Christ would come of the seed of David's seed. And he's just like, wow, why would you choose me? I'm nobody, right? But God informed of that. So he's saying here, the exposition is he knew that this was going to happen. So he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, not himself, but Christ. He spake of Christ's resurrection that his soul, Christ's soul, was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. It's spelled out right there. And why am I even bringing this up? You're saying, Pastor Burns, I really believe this. Because as we continue to look at the descriptions of hell and the reality of hell, and we see the pains of hell, don't ever forget that Jesus Christ went to hell for you before the resurrection. Turn if we were to Luke 16. Luke 16. And by the way, as I mentioned earlier, we all need to, to make sure when we preach the gospel that we are including hell in your presentation. Don't skip over it. Don't gloss over it. Make sure the person now, look, a lot of people, thankfully, a lot of people still understand what hell is, and it's not necessarily a difficult concept for people to, to grip. But there's plenty of people out there still that, that will say things like, I think I'm living in hell, and I don't think it's real. You know, they have all kinds of other weird beliefs. They just think you might just cease to exist and all kinds of things. No, look, you need to understand hell's a real place. It's a place that, that people need to go to. And the Bible even says uh, in the book of Jude, it says, and of some have compassion making a difference, right? So the way you give the gospel to some people, it's going to be a little bit more compassionate. And you're going to be speaking to people in a compassionate way. But then it says, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So with different people, 
they're going to need to hear some different things. Some people might need to just kind of hear it a little bit more comforting way, but other people, it's like, you know what? No, hell is real, and you're going to go there if you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ, and you just need to understand, hey, this is a fact, and this is a truth, and you're there not to condemn them, not to be like, oh, you're so wicked, you know, and, and point the finger at them like, like some people seem to, to enjoy doing that are outside of, of our church. But you see other ministries online where people literally, I think, just like, just enjoy condemning people to hell. But no, it is important to understand hell's real and the, and the consequence of hell and the reality of hell. But the point is to pull them out of the fire. Right? You're telling them so that you can, you can grab them out, yank them out, say, be there to help a hand, right? And be like, hey, Jesus died for you. You deserve hell. Yeah, absolutely. This is your condition, but hey, we're going to yank you out of the fire. I'm going to bring you to the Savior. It's important. Luke 16, let's, let's read through this story here, starting in verse number 19. This is a story that Jesus Christ told, and I don't think that this is only a parable. Right? Now, there's parables in Scripture where truths are expressed giving fictitious stories or analogies, right? And oftentimes you'll hear these parables about, oh, this person or that person, they did something, you know, there was a certain king and, and he went away on a trip, you know, all these various parables. But one of the reasons why I say that this isn't just a parable, because parables are going to be generic this story uses a person's name. We don't see any parable naming people in the story. This looks and feels and reads like real events because I believe they are. There was a man named Lazarus and he was a beggar and we're going to read about him in this story. And it says here in verse number 19, there was a certain rich man, a certain rich, not just, well, there was a king and he had some servants, right? Like we see in other parables. No, there was a, there was a particular rich man. There was one man, a, a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He was living good. He had good clothing and he ate well. It says he fared sumptuously. It's kind of an old way of talking about how you eat. That fair is food. He ate well. So if you want to impress someone later, you'd be like, I fared sumptuously yesterday. <laughs> and see how many people know what you're talking about. But it's, it's, um, that's all I was talking about. This guy was rich, and he ate well, and he was dressed well. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So he's in really bad shape. I mean, you got sores. You're trying to, to just eat crumbs from a table. And you got dogs coming up and licking your sores. I mean, that's just like, I mean, that's just really bad condition to be in, right? Verse 22 says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So in this story, they both die. The beggar goes to be with Abraham and is embraced and comforted by Abraham. That's all it's talking about when it talks about Abraham's bosom. Because when you give someone a hug, you're embracing them into your bosom. It's not like a neon sign, Abraham's bosom, like <laughs> in a door and everyone's walking into, hey, hey, it's good to see you in Abraham's bosom. How are you doing today? No, he greeted him in heaven. Because that's where Abraham is. And that's where everyone goes that has eternal life. So Abraham meets Lazarus, but the rich man, he lifts up his eyes and he's just, he dies and it's just like, boom, as soon as he, as he opens up his eyes, lifts up his eyes, I'm in hell. 
And not only is he in hell, I mean, he's just immediately in torment, being tormented. And he sees Abraham afar off, and he sees Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, to get a good understanding of what hell is like, this is doing a pretty good job. Amen. We say, well, how hot is it really? How bad is it really? Well, it's bad enough for this rich man <coughs> to make the request that the beggar that was full of sores and had dogs licking him would put his finger in water and put that finger in his mouth to get any sense of relief. To be tormented to the point where you would even think like, who here is going to be thinking like, oh man, that would just be so great. Pastor Burzins, if you could just like dip your, your, your finger in water and just come and put that in my mouth. Who thinks that just sounds like, man, that would just be great, wouldn't it? No. You're like, you'd think I was nuts. What are you doing? I'm just trying to help you. Here, Brother Caleb, I'm trying to help you out. Open up. Here, let me, <laughs> let me dip my finger and, and put that in your mouth. <coughs> Why? Because we're not in hell. We're not even close yeah. to experiencing the torment of hell. But when you're engulfed in flames, <coughs> even someone's dirty finger that just has some moisture on it is going to provide relief for you to where he's like coveting this. That's what, that's what he wants to have. That should speak volumes for how bad hell really is. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Now, who, who does it sound like has it worse? Do you think Lazarus had it worse in the lifetime when he had the dogs licking his sores and eating crumbs? Or do you think the rich man has it worse being in hell? I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? And this is another concept that I don't know why people have such a hard time with when something bad happens to people, but they get saved, that whatever bad thing you ever have to go through in this life is worth it if you get saved. Amen. Whether that be being a beggar and eating crumbs, but you're humbled because of that and you put your faith in Jesus Christ to save you, and that's why you did it, because you were humbled through being poor and being a beggar. But now, you're in, but now you end up in heaven? Or whether you're put in bonds and sold into slavery and brought into another country and have to get whipped and beaten, but you get humbled and you hear the gospel and get saved, you know what? That's still better than dying and going to hell. Amen. No matter what happens, no matter what the circumstance is that is wicked or bad or evil or, or just painful on this life, if in the course of those actions, it causes you to humble yourself and put your trust in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen, it's way better that that happened and you go to heaven than you having eaten really well and dressed really well and had people serve you and had everything you could possibly imagine here and then dying and going to hell. Amen. It's such a simple concept. Verse 26, and beside all this, beside us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. He's basically saying, even if you wanted to, like anyone that wants to go from hell to heaven, can't happen. Amen. And anyone that would want to go from heaven to hell, that can't happen either. I don't think there is anyone that would want to do that, but he's still saying it just can't happen. Once you go to hell, that's it. There's no bridge to heaven. Not getting there. The last ship sailed, bearing the banner of Jesus Christ. When you died, your la when you breathed your last breath without putting your faith in him. That was your last opportunity. Verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, 
but thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now we're starting to look at another layer, another level of the torture and torment in hell. It's bad enough you for yourself experiencing the pains of hell. But we can see that the souls in hell are conscious uh, and aware and, and have remembrance of people in their life, in their former life. It's like, hey man, I got five brothers. How much torment is that for someone that you love now going like, man, this place is real. I didn't think this was real. But look, hell is real. Mm -hmm. I don't want my brothers coming here. I don't want my family to come here. This is horrible. Can you please send someone and tell them they don't want to come here. Tell them that this is real. Tell them hell is real. Tell them so that they would not come to this place. With however much torture you're going through, the last thing you want is to have other people that you love come and join you. In that situation, you don't. And, and, and think about just the, the inherent torture of that. Because you'd always want to be around people, but not if it's going to cause them pain. So you would have to want them to not be there, which would then have less people near you that you loved in your lifetime. It, it, it's that, it's that y y you can't win because you're in hell. Nothing is good there. You, you, your family showing up isn't going to be a comfort to you. It's, it's going to be even more painful because now you're going to have to hear them screaming and wailing in pain just like you. Verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. They got the Bible. Yeah. They got the word of God. Right. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He says, no, 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 no. You send Lazarus back. You, if, they, if they see him, they'll change their mind. This is the mindset of the rich man in hell. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And that's true, because Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and you still have people that are going to refuse and going to reject and not hear the word of God. And Jesus Christ proves that. Came back, not enough for some people, which is why faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Got to put your faith in the Word of God. Turn if you would to Mark chapter 9. And Jesus gives his description of hell. He references a couple things that would be better to have happen than a person dying going to hell. And they're pretty extreme. Look at verse number 43 in Mark chapter 9. The Bible says, And if thy, right, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. He said, If, if the case is going to be between you having to cut off your own hand and go to heaven, or you go to hell with both your hands, Cut off the hand. Because it's way better to go into life and just be missing a hand. All right, I, I missed that hand, but you know what? I'm in heaven. As opposed to going to hell, be like, no, 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 I don't want to lose my hands. Yeah, now you're, now you're suffering in hell forever. And notice he says there, into the fire that never shall be quenched. It doesn't ever go out. Never is a long time. Jesus Christ is speaking the truth here. He's not lying. It's not like, oh, well, that's just to scare you. It really will go out one day. No, it won't. He said it's not going out. And he also says in verse 44, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So there's, and again, we take this by faith, but it's what he said. So I believe it, that there are some form of worms that are able to continue just 
eating at your body or doing something, you know, that is not pleasant at all, that these hell worms exist adding to your torture and torment in hell. And they don't ever die. I mean, it makes sense. Worms eat up the, the body, the physical body, the flesh on earth, right? So I envision this as being a, a soul worm that's going to be, you know, eating at you. But, and look, here's the thing. People who are in hell right now, their souls are in hell, but they will also be reunited with their body. They'll have their own, the resurrection of the just and the unjust and, and have their spiritual body, but it's a, it's a body of death, just like their soul, their, their spirit's dead, um, in hell forever. So they'll have some form of, of their flesh continually being in uh, the lake of fire. Verse 45 says, And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter in the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Maybe when you're talking to people who are, might be a hard case on, on, on seeing the reality of hell, Luke 16 is always a good go-to. I like going there, but Mark chapter 9 is also a good place to show someone and just be like, you know, people who, who have had rough lives. Look, I've talked to some people out soul winning that have given me the, I mean, some people are just kind of snowflakes and they're like, oh, I think this is hell here, but they don't really have that bad of a life. But there are other people that I know have had some very significant trauma or, or, or really bad things in their life. Like a, a veteran, for example, that I spoke to that, that experienced and went through. I mean, he didn't go into detail about what he saw, but I could only imagine that the things that he had saw or been through, he's like, I have seen hell, I've been to hell, and I don't ever want to go, you know. But, but he's describing things that happen, things that human beings have done, which look horrific. I'm sure, I don't doubt it for a second, horrific. But start asking, like, are you ready to start lopping off limbs and putting a knife in your eyeball and plucking it out and going like, I, I don't know. Would you say that that is better than what you've gone through? Because Jesus is saying it's better than going to hell. To put it in, in some type of perspective. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 14. As I said earlier, you know, some people just want to teach that hell is separation from God. And there's, there's one aspect of that that's true because you're not in God's good graces, right? So you're separated from having a good relationship with God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because now all you're going to face is the wrath of God. But you're not separated from God in the sense that you're like put in the corner and he's just like his presence just isn't there anymore. Right? Or that he's just put you away and, and there's just no presence of God there. Because the presence of God is everywhere. And the presence of God is felt in hell as much as in heaven. But it's a, it's a different side of God that you're seeing. The people in hell, they're dealing with the presence of God as being full of wrath and anger. Whereas those in heaven don't see the wrath and the anger of God and they're dealing with the Lord. They have a good relationship with God and, and um, will have the, the, the love and the care in heaven. Look at, uh, I'll read for you from Psalm 139 verse 7, the Bible says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Biblically speaking, God is in heaven and he's in hell. Just because God is everywhere. God is contained by his own creation of all the matter of the universe and the heavens. He's not contained. He's not bound by them. God is all uh, all being, all everything. Look at Revelation 14, verse number 9. The Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. 
and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. There's a tormenting again and literally referencing fire and brimstone. And one thing you'll notice, people say, oh yeah, fire, you know, that's just what some people say. No, look, the Bible says that and only is talking about fire. Like every single time that hell's brought up, fire is, re is referenced. And that's why I love Brother Jared was, was brought that up today. He was out the door with someone, talking about there's two places you could go, heaven or hell, right? And he's like, just tell me one thing about hell that's real common, it's like fire, right? Fire exists in hell. That's what everyone should know about hell because the Bible talks about that every single time. It's not just an analogy. It's not just something to make you think, oh, well, it's just really a bad place. Well, it is really a bad place, but, it, but there's fire there. It's real. It's fire and brimstone. And people who are there are being tormented with fire and brimstone. Look at this in verse 10. Tor tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Jesus Christ is there in his presence. People are going to be tormented with fire and brimstone. He's not gone. He's there. But he's not their Savior. I mean, he is in the sense that he died for the sins of the whole world, but, but it, did, it did no good unto them because they believed not on him. And the smoke of their torment... Verse 11, ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, specifically in the context, this is talking about people who take the mark of the beast, but it's referencing them being in hell. And I would submit that there is no reason to think that anyone else in hell has it any better than the people who take the mark of the beast. That, them, that just by virtue of being in hell, you're going to be tormented with fire and brimstone. And the smoke of that torment is going to send up forever and ever. And people in hell have no rest day or night. Which, again, is its own torture, again, in and of itself. No rest. I mean, think about being put through whatever bad experience you've ever gone through it always comes to an end. And then you get the relief of, oh, thank God that is over, right? Whatever that may be. It doesn't end in hell. And you're going to know it's not going to end in hell. There is one moment that people in hell right now are going to be looking forward to, and that's standing before the judgment seat, the, the, the great white throne judgment of God. When death and hell deliver up the dead out of it. And that is going to be the best experience they'll ever have. Because as soon as they get judged, getting cast into the lake of fire. Which is what the Bible says there in Revelation chapter 20. Verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Are we seeing a common theme here? Tormented day and night forever and ever. It doesn't end. And I saw a great white throne, verse 11, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The dead, these do not have their name in the book of life. The book of life is open because it's checking up. Oh, yep, none of these people are written in the book of life. So you're getting judged according to your works. And they're going to realize now every person who might not have known exactly why they went to hell. They're going to find out exactly why they've gone to hell. Because they're going to be judged according to their works. And until you really stop and meditate on that, you don't realize how bad that would look if you were to be judged by your works. You know how easy it is to sin. Imagine every single sin from every moment of your life. You did this, 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 this. I mean, imagine that. I mean, even your thoughts. I can't even think of all the thoughts I've ever had. I mean, just like, like for, for, for every waking moment when you've, when you've, thought something wrong, when you've done something wrong, when you know every single sin, every single one, every one, 
every day of your life. And compare that to the good that you've done, too. I mean, if he's just going to judge you by your works, it's like, hey, you did this or this or this. And for the people that want to say, oh, your good outweighs your bad, no. I mean, really stop and think about it. Really? Really? Does your good really outweigh your bad? No, not if you're honest with yourself. No way. No way. And I'd like to think that I'm a good person, but at the end of the day, no. The couple hours that we spent out soul winning today, right? Great. That's, hey, that's a good work. But are we just doing good work all the time in our day-to-day -day life? No. That's more of the exception than the rule. Now, look, of course, we're trying to do good. But just the reality of it, if you just had to face all of your works... It's going to become apparent and people are going to see, no, God is righteous. He's the righteous judge. It's right. And just all the more reason for us to thank Jesus. Thank you. I would not want to face my works in judgment at that great white throne judgment. Because the righteous judge finds that the verdict is the lake of fire for all of them. And that is a scary place to be. And look, kids, I hope you're listening to this sermon about hell. And many of you are being brought up by Christian parents. But you can't rely on your parents' faith to save you. You can't rely on coming to this church to be saved. It's not about the church attendance. It's not about who your parents are. You have to have your own faith. And understand, hell's a real place. And every single one of us is accountable for ourselves. You have to decide for yourself that you are going to put your faith in Jesus Christ to save your soul. And I hope you've already done that. And if you did, praise the Lord. That's great. But I'd, I, would, I would hate for anyone, any, especially the little ones, the, the, the people who grow up in this church, and in the years to come, they've been here, they come to church, they leave. Man, I just, it, it's a dread to think that anyone, any of the young people would leave here not saved. And, and I'm sure it'll probably happen. But the choice is up to you. I don't want it to happen, but look, everyone has their own choice. Understand the reality of hell and that that's a penalty for your sins. You've all, you've all committed those sins. And hell is not a place that we even like to think about, let alone have to face going to. But thank God that he loves you and you've got a way to be saved by just trusting Jesus who paid for your sins for you. Amen. Accept his free gift. Call on the name of the Lord if you haven't done so. If you haven't done so in faith, call on him and let him save you. Just like Psalm 116. O oh Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. That's enough. You got the faith in your heart? Call on God to deliver your soul. There's more, a lot more in Scripture in general about hell. This is just a glimpse into the reality of hell and, and, and the, the pains of hell. This is one of the things that should drive us and push us to continue to preach the gospel to the lost. When it doesn't fit in with your schedule, when it becomes a burden to have to Take the time and skip doing something else because hell is real and because people are going there. And just because you may be saved and you know you're not going there, just take a minute to think about the amount of souls that are going there. And that what you do by putting forth your time humbly with the Word of God to show people how to be saved can have that difference and have that impact so that people will ne some people will never have to face hell through your efforts because God has entrusted you with his gospel.
He has put that great position into your hands to be able to show other people how to be saved and to avoid that horrible place. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of eternal life that you've given that to us for free and that you save us from such a terrible place of torture and torment in, in God. I pray that you would help us to, do our, to, to be able to express to people in this lifetime uh, the realities of hell, that it, that it is a real place, that they could understand that it's a real place, dear Lord, so that they could turn to you and seek you and that there are many that we'd be able to uh, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh, dear Lord. I pray that you would uh, just help us as we endeavor to, to reach souls for Christ. And God, again, a great big thank you for for all that you've done for us in, in regards to our spe salvation especially and for saving us poor sinners. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.